Hey, how's it going? Um, I want to start off by uh, dedicating this talk to my wife. And you guys are thinking, like, why the hell did he just do that? That sounds very weird. Uh, but I mean, the, uh, the theme of the conference is without borders. And I haven't done talks for a pretty long time. Uh, I think the real difference right now is uh, the people in this room. Raise your hand if you're a developer. And raise your hand if you're on the publishing side. So there's developers, and then there's publishers. And then we've got the camera over there with Twitch. Uh, so you actually have uh, developers or publishers looking from the outside. You actually have players that are now looking into the room. My wife's been asking me if she can come follow me to a conference. I've always said no, and she's never seen any of my talks. And then now we've got this camera over there. So this is def she's definitely going to see it. My dad's probably going to see it. So this whole concept of without borders, I think, is, uh, is, is a good one for the show. So where is my clicker? OK, so my talk is called uh, Kitchen Meets World. Uh, it's probably pretty obvious that it's going to talk about the globalization of games. Um, I think games are already global, so it's kind of awkward to say globalization of games. Um, but this concept of without borders, I think, is a really good one, because it doesn't really just talk about territories. I think it's obvious to say, OK, well, now games are in Asia, and they should come to the West, or games are in the West, and they're going to come to the East. And I think you're going to see some interesting talks that talk about that. Uh, but I don't think that's all we're talking about when we're talking about borders. So uh, you guys are probably familiar with this game. Uh, if you're not, it's Maple Story. Uh, we brought this out. I brought this out to the States back in 2005. Uh, at the time uh, when we launched it, I was running BD in production for the global service of Maple Story. And uh, what we did was we actually created a, uh, an English version of the game because we wanted to find out what markets this game might be popular in. Um, and so it was kind of like a location tracker. And that very same year, in 2004, uh, we had actually kind of severed our uh, North American operations because we didn't actually feel like it was going to be successful. So when we put out Maple Story in its English version, uh, what we actually found was there was a lot of North American players that were logging into the game. And what that did was it forced us to open a North American operations a year following. Um, I think that was 2005. And then we opened doors in 2006. Uh, at that time, I think we were just really excited uh, that players were coming into the game. We didn't really think about uh, why it was successful. And we didn't really understand that, hey, because we don't have to go to retail and players could just find the game and find each other and spread information about this game, that was the reason why MapleStory was adopted in the States. So going to... 2009, uh, I actually gave a talk uh, kind of about the future of games. And this is one of the slides from that time. Uh, so I had this concept of uh, the connected generation or bubble baby babies. I think people just call them millennials now. Um, and the idea was that you had all these kids that were logging on to Club Penguin, uh, Webkins, Neopets. And you see the numbers right there. It's like 9 million, 1.5, uh, 7 million. And essentially what they're doing is they're finding what they want online and they're finding their friends online and hanging out with them. And these are all super basic concepts that everybody understands now, but I think back then were pretty foreign. And then the other idea was that this generation would be the most connected generation because they would not know a world without the internet. Um, so the YouTubes, the MySpaces, which you know, really isn't there anymore, Google, Facebook, uh, downloading apps on Apple, uh, Twitter, those were kind of newer concepts at that time. But the thought was that there would be kind of like a super race of ga online gamers that were born from these group of kids that were born in the year 2000. Uh, and fast forwarding to the year 2015, that these kids would probably be 15 years old uh, and, and would be the super race of gamers that are, have landed on the planet. I think that's probably true. Online games are bigger than ever before, uh, represented by a lot of different games, including League of Legends. You know how many gamers play that. Uh, and those are probably the very kids that were on Club Penguin back, uh, back in those times. Um, so going again on this concept of without borders, it's not just geography. I think it's really the without borders of uh, players interacting with other players. So the Facebooks, the YouTubes, there's been so many different ways that people are now interacting with each other, uh, posting videos of themselves playing games, uh, watching videos of others playing games, uh, tweeting being able to engage in a conversation with somebody and have thousands of other people kind of looking in and able to also engage, uh, and then the Instagrams and the Twitches and the Reddits. So all of these things are, I think, just kind of mainstay stuff now. But back then, I don't think we could have forecasted that. And in 2007, um, 
I remember watching the, uh, the iPhone note, and I think Steve Jobs was saying that, oh, this is a, what is it? This is an iPod, uh, this is a phone, and this is an internet communicator. You know, this is an iPod, this is a phone, this is an internet communicator. And I remember thinking at the time, like, there's no way you're gonna take away my Blackberry. That was the, <laughs> and I think everybody was feeling that at that time. Uh, but sure enough, I think what this device did was it obviously put applications in people's hands and it connected people like they've never been connected be before. But I think another basic thing that it did was it made people connected all the time, uh, which wasn't true. Um, and I think uh, until this actually really took off, it was always people kind of jumping to their computer, figuring out what they're going to do, what they're going to consume, how they're going to connect with people. But as soon as this really took off, I, I actually see that people turn on their computer less because they're already communicating with people through this device in all their various ways. So I think since that time, gaming's really changed. It's come out of the box. Um, another without borders comment. It's come out of the box and it's really become a part of our culture. Um, I think it's grown from a way to play uh, to a kind of a way to be. Uh, it's really become a part of our journey and also a part of our identity as players. And this one's a really interesting one. Uh, this is from Minecon. So I had the opportunity to go to Minecon back in Miami. And uh, when, when I got there, I saw a lot of interesting things. I think one of the things that I found uh, really striking was kind of this care of parents uh, with their kids who are very enthusiastic about this game called Minecraft, uh, which really represents kind of the creative, creative spirit of, uh, I think, kids. Uh, but what it really tells me here is that there is a multi-generational opportunity in games that really hasn't existed before. Uh, so I remember growing up playing games on my Nintendo. I think I, that was the first thing I bought uh, with money that I saved up for myself. And um, I remember my, my mother telling me, when are you going to grow up and stop playing this thing? And there's you know, many times in your life where you hear that. It's like, when are you going to grow up and, and stop doing this? And if you watch uh, the, I, I, and I think this is a global story, uh, if you watch the League of Legends Road, Road to Worlds video, uh, you'll see a, uh, a, a video of a, a, a player who's a League of Legends pro player, and it's the same thing. It's his father saying, when are you going to grow up? Uh, if you're not going to stop playing this game, you should get out of the house, and it's a very emotional kind of video. But I think what this is actually showing us is that there is now a multi-generational opportunity, is that games are a universal need, that you discover as a child, but it's not something that you discard, it's something that you continue to grow with and that your, your kids are gonna play and then you can kind of play together. Um, the other thing about Minecraft is uh, the educational aspect of it is you don't just play the game, it's inspiring people to create, it's inspiring people to learn about game development uh, and I think that's gonna result in some pretty amazing things in the future. Uh, I don't know if uh, David Helgeson is in the audience. Uh, but I, th I think Unity is doing that too. Unity's mission is to democratize gameplay. So if you look at the generation of kids playing Minecraft and you look at Unity and all the different things that are coming out, I think if you fast forward 10 years from now, we're gonna see some amazing things where the walls are gonna be broken down and players and you know, everybody's gonna be able to create and contribute to the creative process. Um, are you guys all familiar with Star Citizen? So the, I think the interesting thing about Star Citizen, a lot of people look at this and, you know, Kickstarter was a major thing that allowed uh, consumers to really kind of bet on the things that they wanted to support. And I think there's the good side of Kickstarter, the things that haven't really gone very well. And they apply that to Star, Star Citizen as well and says, okay, well, Chris Roberts has um, pulled in roughly around $40 million plus on crowdfunding for Star Citizen. And I think the things that I hear oftentimes in the public is, well, are they going to be able to deliver on this game? Uh, and I, I think s some people feel like, well, he's just really drawing the cash uh, for this promise of something that's never really going to come out. And I think it, that's a, it's a really poor way to look at this, uh, because I think what Chris Roberts is showing us is that there is a need or uh, there's a desire for players to connect with developers in ways that they've never really connected with them before. And what Chris Roberts is offering uh, is the future of, of a game that he's going to create, but he's also offering an experience to actually interact in the development process and bring people inside. And I think that interaction is really what's generating that value of the $40 million in crowdfunding and something that we should learn from. Uh, 
PewDiePie, if you don't know who PewDiePie is, that's a, a serious problem. Uh, <laughs> I looked him up uh, last night on Wikipedia. I think he's actually been viewed over six billion times. Uh, that's a pretty staggering number. If you divide it by the number of minutes, divided by the number of hours, divided by the number of days, it would probably take a single person 10,000 plus hours to watch, you know, whatever, six billion views of PewDiePie. Um, and it's very interesting because if you rewind back even five years ago, back to 2009, I don't think anybody, any of us were really thinking about this of players wanting to connect with other players, players wanting to share their moments online. Uh, and it's really creating this kind of connection of a community uh, uh, of this generation of gamers that really never existed before because gaming was really something that you did in your room, on your couch. And maybe you had your buddy that was sitting next to you watching you play Final Fantasy, but that was roughly about it. Uh, now it's being shared by millions of players uh, and their experiences are shared all over the world. Uh, and PewDiePie is famous over here, but you've got the same stories that are also happening in Korea as well, and in China as well, for sure. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, this is the uh, staple center image of the League of Legends finals that happened last year. Um, I was there, I, was, I sat right in that, next to that little circle and almost got my head shot off by a confetti cannon. cannon. Uh, but it was a pretty massive uh, experience, and I think um, it's something that if you rewound back a few years ago, you, no one would have forecasted it. I remember meeting uh, Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill, and they were kind of talking about the future, and uh, when you heard them, you're, you kind of felt like they were dreaming. It's like they were taking these kind of, um, making promises of the kind of these moonshots. Would they ever be able to do this? And when you were at that staple, staple center, like, they did it. Uh, you could feel it. You could feel the uh, enthusiasm of the players, and this isn't, it, it's out of the box. It's, it's part of the, it's, it's not marketing. It's basically a part of an, an experience that's never really been had before, but the players are saying that they want this. And they're having their finals, I think, next week or the week after in South Korea at the World Cup Stadium. And this is the only other example that I can tell that gets really remotely close to kind of what you see with FIFA, with the enthusiasm of the uh, my country versus that country. And it's a pretty amazing thing that they've created. Uh, but it's no longer League of Legends the game, it's League of Legends the experience or global experience. And I think that's a pretty amazing thing. Um, Warcraft, World of Warcraft is actually being made as a movie. You guys are probably familiar with that. Uh, there's been a lot of video game movies previously. Uh, they've all been generally pretty bad, their exploitations on the IP. I think the difference with uh, the World of Warcraft IP is that it's being made by legendary pictures, which doesn't mean like, oh, that's, that's the reason why it's great. But I think what it's telling us is that video game IP is no longer something that's just being exploited. Uh, it's, it's something that is more like a Batman. It's more like a Superman. So if you fast forward uh, this business that they originally called Niche, all these kind of um, the Warcrafts or the League of Legends or the Marios, I think they are going to be the most recognized IPs in the future. And that's being validated by the creation of this movie. And, and this over here, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Are you, it's, uh, it's a character from League of Legends. And I remember working in South Korea at Nexon back in 2003, and we did a focus group uh, back then where we created silhouettes of all of our characters. Uh, and then we created silhouettes of all the famous kind of global characters like Mickey Mouse, et cetera. And when we showed them to uh, the elementary school students at the time, and we said, identify these characters, they could not identify all the global characters. But what they could identify were uh, characters from our games because they were being played so much. And when you look at uh, Annie and Tibbers here, for certain countries or certain age demographic, these, these characters are gonna be way more popular uh, than some of the traditional IPs that we've actually grown up, grown up with. And if you look at certain countries, they are going to be the thing that kids remember. This will be the Mario of a certain generation within a certain country. And that's a pretty amazing thing. So it's 2014 now, and in the last five years, I mean, all these slides that I've shown you right now seem pretty obvious, but if you, if you rewind back to 2009 and you thought about these things, some of these things would have probably sounded very crazy at the time. And these things are happening all over the world. Um, now, if you look at this board right now, you've got Crossfire, Warface, World of Tanks, Sudden Attack, and these are massive games that are uh, pretty much market dominant leaders and potentially regarded as phenomenons. I was just talking with Eugene last night and uh, 
I think World of Tanks, I was not aware, uh, in February recorded over 1.2 million concurrent users in Russia, and that's pretty phenomenal uh, for the population of that country. And so gaming has already been uh, globalized. It's already a global opportunity. I don't think we need to talk about the globalization of games. Uh, but that's not, that's not uh, what I'm trying to really push for right now. Um, last night, Phil Harrison talked about, uh, talked about some things, but he had this image, so I decided to put this in my deck as well. And uh, it's kind of going to the moon. Uh, and so I think the globalization of games has already happened, uh, but I'm, what I'm really calling for and what I'm forecasting is that there will be games, I think, within the next five years or 10 years that are actually gonna become global phenomenons, not games that are successful uh, in Korea or successful in North America and happen to move over. I think that there's actually gonna be the glo a global phenom phenomenon that actually goes uh, all over the world and creates experiences that we've never seen before due to the interaction of players in those markets. Um, Oh man, I'm going. I'm just gonna That's play this video. Too. I'm fucking going. <laughs> no, baby, you think it the most. But you know what the funniest thing about Europe is? What? It's the little differences. I mean, they got the same shit over there that they got here, but it's just, just there, it's a little different. Example. All right, well, you can walk into a movie theater in Amsterdam and buy a beer. And I don't mean just like a little paper cup, I'm talking about a glass of beer. And in Paris, you can buy a beer in McDonald's. And you know what they call a. Uh, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, in Paris. They don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese? I mean, they got the metric system. They wouldn't know what the fuck a quarter pounder is. And what do they call it? They call it uh, a Royale with cheese. Royale with cheese. That's right. What do they call a Big Mac? Big Mac's a Big Mac, but they call it Le Big Mac. Le Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> what do they call a Whopper? I don't know. I didn't go on a Burger King. You know what they put on French fries in Holland instead of ketchup? What? Mayonnaise. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen them do it, man. They fucking drown them in this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've actually seen this on both sides of the ocean. So working in Korea, coming to the States, uh, working with people on the Western front, thinking of Asia. And generally, when uh, people want to go to another country, they, ju they judge it by their own eyes. Uh, so he kind of talks about, oh, man, they drowned their French fries and mayonnaise, and that's freaking disgusting. Well, I remember uh, coming to North America back in 2006 and kind of evangelizing this idea of free to play. And when I talked to them about, well, you know what you can do is you can actually offer the game for free, people play online, and then they might buy items in your game if they feel like it'll enhance the experience or if they like it. And that's the exact reaction that I got is like, this is some crazy shit that they do over in Asia. It's never going to work over here. This is not how people are going to play games. Fast forward back now to 2014, uh, I think it's definitely not the, it's not gonna be the only way, but it's definitely a main way that, one of the main ways that people will interact with games going forward. Um, but when you're thinking about other markets, I think generally you just kind of look at it with your own eyes, and you also look at it from a product perspective of like, okay, well, if my product's good enough, if people understand what my product is, I might be able to be successful in that market. Um, the problem is they're not exactly sure what products are gonna make it in those markets, so it gets even more confusing. Um, but my point uh, for my talk isn't actually gonna focus on the uh, products themselves, because I feel like the developers are gonna figure that out. There's gonna be a lot of people that try, not many that make it, but there's gonna be some that make it that would be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about is uh, the evolution of what I think games are actually becoming. So I found this uh, slide yesterday, or over the weekend, uh, by a company called Mood Design. I think they're a consulting company. And what, and what they were really trying to talk to was the experience of restaurants, but I think it's very relevant for, uh, for games. So if you look at the center, it says the concept. And I think that the concept is generally what you would call the, uh, the fantasy for a game. So in the restaurant business, it's the idea, it's the design, it's the story. Um, and then if you look at the orange circle, it calls it the meal. That's the presentation, the aroma, the taste. And we generally stop right there. So we say, okay, that's the product. What, are, what product are we gonna try to make? Le Big Mac or Royale with cheese or whatever that is. Once we get that, we can find a local publisher and we can take the game over there and they'll be able to go maximize that. And I think that used to work in the product space, uh, but I think what we're finding with all the other kind of slides that I showed you before, there is an evolution in games that's happening right now um, that is calling for an, uh, an experience. The customer expectation is no longer the product it's actually an experience. And the experience is the collective 
<clears throat> of everything that's happening there right now. It's the food, uh, it's the environment, it's the lighting, it's the furniture, it's the people, it's the sound. Uh, for a game, it might be something different. It could be uh, League of Legends with their esports. What would League of Legends be without their world finals? Um, and I think that's the expectation that games are actually changing towards. So I've been using this internally a lot, is that, okay, it's great that we make a game, and that's, the game is pivotal, it's the most important thing, it's fundamental to where we take this experience going forward, it's the way by which we should connect with our audience and the way that they should connect with each other. Uh, but there should be an evolution of that experience that gets us from E1 to E2 to E3 to what I call EP, which is phenomenal experience. And that needs to be architected and designed over time. You can't just make the game and just put it out there and, and that's the end. And oftentimes I actually, I, I see that uh, with talking to people. And what I'm gonna talk about is how you might actually be deterred from ever getting to an EP uh, based on this restaurant model. So um, taking the restaurant model, if you look, the K represents the kitchen, R represents the restaurant. So by restaurant, I mean front of the house. Um, that's the publisher. K is the developer. And the kitchen is where they do all the cooking. That's where the game is actually made. And the publishing on, on online games is where you do all the servicing aspects, you do the marketing, uh, you do the customer service, uh, everything around the game. In restaurants, you would say you take the reservations, you do the marketing, you clean the tables, uh, you set the tables, et cetera. But what happens when you go global and the kitchen is detached from the restaurant? So in the case of Nexon America, most of our development happens with developers back in Korea for a game like Maple Story or Combat Arms or what have you. And what, it, what that actually adds is a gap uh, because the front of the house is in a different country. So there's obviously a, uh, and these things should not be underestimated is there's time, there's language, uh, there's culture, and then there's also distance. And just that very nature of being uh, being abroad actually changes that experience that you can offer to the consumer. So just think about it in a restaurant case, okay, if the kitchen is back there and they deliver your food and it's not that good, then they could send it back and then you can get something really quick. But if it's over the ocean and say we do a patch and something ends up coming out and it doesn't work out, now you've got all this time that has to go between getting the file and it just takes a lot longer. So you don't have that same experience that you would have if the kitchen and the restaurant were actually together. Uh, the other thing to recognize is uh, the existence of supports. So in your domestic market, you never acknowledge or realize all the supports that you have. So if you're really successful in, say, North America, um, you wouldn't recognize that there are certain supports because you find them to be natural. What you would find is that that country is kind of weird because uh, they're not able to be successful. I don't know why that is. And so if you look over here, when I came to North America, one of the things that I didn't really realize was uh, PC cafes don't exist here uh, or in, in North America or in Europe. But in South Korea, they're all over the place. There's probably 20,000 uh, PC cafes in South Korea that people could play games on. And that's just a natural support that Korea has uh, that you don't really think about when you go internationally. Um, some of you might not realize this, but PC cafes are a way for them to actually monetize, for companies to monetize in uh, South Korea. So if somebody plays a game for a certain amount of time, then we would get a percentage off of that. So that would be part of our business model. But taking the game overseas uh, to North America, we actually don't have that. And there's so many things that the cafe would do. It's, it would market the game for you. You would sit next to somebody else and you would have more fun because you're right next to them. Uh, there's user interface things that are taken care of because there's somebody right next to you telling you, oh, that's the button that you have to press. But when we uh, ran surveys in North America with our players, 90-something percent of them said that they played in their home by themselves. Um, and so the, these natural supports, you just don't kind of understand. But I'll put, it, I'll, I'll put another uh, slide up that might um, have you see it in different eyes from a North American perspective or a Western perspective. Um, so if you were to develop a game and that game were to be science fiction. Uh, oftentimes, Western developers get really frustrated when they pitch science fiction ideas to Korea because Korean publishers will generally say, I don't want it, it's science fiction. And they'll say, well, what do you mean you don't want it, it's science fiction? Science fiction is great here. And the Korean publisher would say, no, it's not, we don't like science fiction. And they would say, okay, well, what about StarCraft? StarCraft was massive. What do you, how, do you, how can you say Koreans don't like science fiction? Well, I think what they don't realize is StarCraft was amazing because it was a great game, 
it wasn't necessarily amazing because it was science fiction. And if you look at this, in terms of supports, Star Trek and Star Wars were something that all of us kind of grew up with growing up in the West. But these IPs are pretty much unknown when it comes to Korea. So science fiction, everything that you've kind of built up over time that makes you really like space or like zombies or like vampires, they didn't actually grow up with. So if you bring it as a fantasy, uh, it doesn't actually have that support. It doesn't necessarily mean science fiction can't be successful in Asia. It means that you just don't have that natural support uh, that would make it more successful. Now, another way to look at that, let me rewind this, this restaurant is in a local market, it would look like this. And you would get requests from the restaurant to the kitchen saying, hey, maybe this food is a little bit too spicy. Or, hey, maybe you need to prepare this differently. Or, they already ate their food, can you send them the next thing? But what it really looks like when you go global is it looks like this. And it's essentially Korea, China, North America, Europe, et cetera. And they're all connected to the same kitchen. And they're all asking the kitchen, the developer, for different things. And you as a developer developing for the world start getting very confused because one side's saying, hey, I want, um, I want this to be blue. And another side of the ocean is saying, hey, I want this to be red. And it's complete, completely conflicting and confusing for the developer. Um, and oftentimes it's really more like this because the game has started in a certain main market and become successful. That's probably why it went international in the first place. And what you, what you will have is requests coming from all over the world representing all different players. But more than likely, they'll really satisfy the one market that's a dominant local market. And what that will do is lower your opportunity to get bigger in those other markets. So just rewind this one more time. So that's your main market, say South Korea. And then when you take the game internationally, it'll be moderately successful, but it will never kind of reach that phenomenal status because it's made for that local market and it doesn't necessarily have the supports that make it phenomenal in those markets. So the idea is, could we as developers actually create a game with the focus of going to the world from the beginning rather than an afterthought? Um, or rather than after getting successful in this market first. And I think that's something that hasn't been done before, but I imagine in the next few years, it is gonna happen. There is gonna be a company that thinks about uh, creating a game to actually uh, entertain the world, and that will happen in the next few years. Now, there's a lot of challenges, and I can't actually give you the solution to solving all of those, uh, because I don't know what those are for any particular game, but I think one area where uh, people actually get lost is that they don't look towards the players. So rewinding back here, you've got all these players telling you different things, but oftentimes it, you start looking inward towards yourself for the solutions, and I think that the solution would be uh, to bring the kitchen as close to the players as possible uh, to, create a, to, to create an entertainment property that actually works for the entirety of the world. So that's really my point there is that the time is coming for a phenomenal experience that I think is actually gonna change the face of gaming. Uh, there are gonna be different things that we don't know what they are yet, and I, that sounds like a cop-out, but you're already seeing it in different properties. So if you look at even League of Legends uh, being played globally, if you watch that Road to Worlds video, it talks about um, gamers playing over in Europe, North America, and Asia, and their different play styles, and how that's actually changing the play of the game. And I think that those types of things are actually gonna change how we end up uh, developing the games and how the games end up forming in the future. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to close. Thank you.